is where we are uh, today. There are other things that uh, was quite remarkable that happened in Indonesia. One is what we call the quiet revolution uh, in Indonesia. Uh, there was no people riding in the streets, but the political map was changed forever. Uh, now, what happened was between 2004 and 2009, we had a political decentralization whereby every governor, every mayor, every region in Indonesia would be directly elected. Now we're talking about hundreds of uh, elections uh, within the time space of that five years. And within that five years, the political pyramid turned upside down. Everybody got directly elected from the top all the way to the bottom. And what is amazing was all this happened without a bloodshed, without chaos, and in an orderly way. You know, we, we had a couple of electoral disputes, but in general, they're all went quite smoothly and hence the quiet revolution. And another thing that was also significant is the fundamental change in the national mindset. Now, uh, this Dino, when it's speaking in front of me, is very different than the Dino that was 20 years ago. And this is the same thing to almost every Indonesian because uh, I passionately and strongly believe that in Indonesia, democracy is irreversible. There is no alternative to democracy in Indonesia. The prospect of military coup in Indonesia is quite unthinkable now, if you ask uh, you know, the common Indonesians or the, 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 the elite. Uh, there was a poll recently that was taken uh, in Indonesia in 2009, and the poll found that 85% of Indonesians believe that the country is in the right direction. 85%. Even though they hated the president or they hated for one political party or the other, they believe the system is right for them. Right? 85%. In just a matter of nine years. Right? So there is quite phenomenal change of the mindset. And this is not just happening in Jakarta. Indonesia is not a state of the United States. You know, we have about 130 million people who love making babies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is something that is happening at the uh, capital and also spread out. Uh, throughout Indonesia. But I think the most important change in Indonesia's political uh, development is the fact that it is now system-based rather than personality-based. You know, uh, Indonesia's political development was uh, <coughs> not damaged, but evolved uh, being dependent on strong president, strong personalities. This is Sukarno who ruled for so many years, and then Suharto who ruled for over 30 years, just like uh, President um, Mubarak. And the whole system revolved around this strong personality to the extent that when they fell, the system fell with them, because there was no strong system, right? So what we have been doing since 1998 is to build a system and away from politics based on strong personalities. So President Yudhoyono, who is very popular, uh, who will end his term in 2014, will step down inevitably because he is constitutionally mandated to step down. But the country will go on because the system is already in place. And that is what is most important, I think, in terms of democratic lessons for other countries. Focus on the system and build that system. And direct elections also change the whole dynamics. You know, in the old system, if you want to have a president in Indonesia, uh, that president was only elected by 600 lawmakers. What does that mean? If you have enough money, there's only 600 of them. Each <laughs> right? But if you have direct elections, you can't pay 100 million people to vote for it. Right? So uh, that released a lot of the idiosyncrasies that burdened us uh, in the past. So direct election to me was, for us, was this magic powder that freed Indonesia's political aspiration and not for our political system. So that is where we are now, a good, stable democracy uh, with good unity, uh, good economic growth, uh, social dynamism, and so on and so on. But there remain a lot of challenges in Indonesia's democracy. Let me just quickly enumerate some of them. One, the battle for the soul of Indonesia continues. You know, uh, in Indonesia, 
there are those who still want to bring Indonesia back to the authoritarianness. Surprisingly, you know, even some of the younger politicians are more conservative than the, 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 the president. Uh, there are those who want to bring Indonesia into the Islamic State, but it's a minority. But still, that battle for the soil of Indonesia, you can see being reflected in Indonesia's uh, legislature, in government, in media, in politics, and so on. Secondly, money politics is still a problem. And I know this is not exclusive to Indonesia. Uh, even in advanced democracies, we have this problem. But in Indonesia, this is something that we have to sort out by laws, and by the system, and by any other means. How to minimize money politics in Indonesia's democratic development. Third, mass authoritarianism. Um, this is, uh, you see what's been happening in the news in Indonesia recently with the uh, incidents with the minority religious sects of other. That's, a, that's one of them. State authoritarianism has declined, or in fact, you don't see any more cross human rights violations by the government, by the state. But at the max level, this right is increasing. You see more religious for ethnic intolerance, you see uh, a little bit more extremism, you see more mob justice, uh, and so on and so on. And this is a problem for our democratic development. There's also a danger that Indonesia's democracy is becoming elitist. You know, uh, yes, it's directly elected by the uh, grassroots, but uh, for some reason, it's becoming more elitist than it should be, and this is not healthy. Uh, for us. And this is coupled by a growing culture of cynicism. Again, if you ask me why or how, I don't know. But that culture of cynicism is thriving in Indonesia, especially among the youth, uh, and, and also in the academics and in the media uh, as well. So uh, that's about Indonesia. Let me just try to connect a little bit with uh, the Egypt uh, uh, situation, because uh, somebody mentioned it. You mentioned it. You mentioned it. Uh, I don't want to tell. I don't want to get into my predictions about uh, Egypt because I, uh, yeah, every time I predict something, something else always uh, uh, happens. But if what Egypt can learn from the Indonesian experience are four things. Right? Uh, if they want to ask how did Indonesia get it right, uh, I would give my four. Right? First, uh, the importance of leadership during transition. You know, we have that transition where the Vice President, President Habibi, Vice President Habibi became President, uh, and he became President, uh, I, I don't think he was expecting it at all, but to the surprise of himself and everyone, probably, uh, he became the most reformist President ever in Indonesia's history. He just kept running, sprinting with reforms. He pushed it, even though he had no popular mandate. He was elected. He was just sort of sidekick. But, he took that authority to push reform as far as possible. He uh, removed uh, 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 rep repressive laws, he released political prisoners, he gave uh, press freedom, uh, free political parties, uh, and so on and so on. Right? So, the quality of the leader during that transition mattered a lot for us, and I know it will matter for you. Secondly, uh, we kept the ruling elite and nudged them in the transition. Right? Uh, this is, I think, a mistake that we did momentarily in Iraq. We took out the Ba'ath Party, and no one was ready to assume uh, 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 the new power uh, structure uh, in, in, in Iraq. But in Indonesia, Golkar was kept part of the transition, the ruling party. The military was kept as part of that uh, transition. And both the opposition and the ruling structure move along together, not easily, but they move bit by bit, they make hard compromises to, move, to push the democratic transition forward. Third was the military. Now, you know the military was important in Indonesia because uh, at some point in Indonesia, the military was a political master. Uh, and in Egypt also, the military is very important. Now, uh, in Indonesia, luckily, the military, for their own sake, but also perhaps for other reasons as well, they saw that they had no choice but to embrace and support reform in democracy. And this is what they did. But in fact, of all the reforms in Indonesia, military reforms is 
one of the most advanced. You know, if you look at bureaucratic reforms, legal reforms, legislative reforms, electoral reforms, judicial reforms, infrastructure reforms, military reform is among the most advanced. And the most early, uh, actually my president, my current president is the one who launched it early on. Um, so, so the ability of the military to push democracy and reform early on and stuck with it was very important. I think it will be important for the to do But four is really the ability to produce quality, free and fair multi-party elections. And this is absolutely critical. Now, if you see uh, you know, the riots and uh, the inequities, uh, 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 the problems in Egypt, you can see quite visibly the pent-up anger and frustration of the Egyptian people that has been there for over two decades or even probably more. <coughs> now, if you have a system of elections where periodically, every four years or five years, you are able to cleanse them, at least take out that steam, you will have a healthy political development or healthier political development. In Indonesia, we've done it three times, in 1999, in 2004, and 2009. So that's quite periodic uh, for these unhappiness or frustration, whatever, of people to be channeled to, uh, to, uh, to the elite and more democratic transition uh, forward. And in fact, that would be my argument if the NDI or the World Movement for Democracy want to promote uh, democracy. Because sometimes the argument has been coined in terms of democratic peace. Yeah? Uh, the more democracy you have, the more peaceful relations between states, which is true. Both, right? And uh, I don't know why, but it's not an argument that is heard enough in the emerging democracies. But I would argue that it's not a sexy enough argument to project the emerging democracies or countries that will become future democracies. I think what you need to tell them is that, look, elections, free and fair multi-party elections, is important not just for international security, but it is important for the long-term political, economic, and social health of your own nation, right? Because otherwise, all these things, right, like Mark Temple, you know, will just pop at some point, uh, and, and uh, that's not what you want. So I think you need, we need to point back more in, in those terms, and especially if you look at what's happening in Tunisia, what's happening in Egypt. Uh, and what's happening in other countries. This is what's definitely happening. The lack of a political mechanism by which the aspiration of the people can be democratically channeled uh, uh, to produce electoral and political capital. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.